Um, thank you uh, again, and, and thank you for all being here. This is, a, this is an exciting event. Um, WIC Food Package Change Evaluation Symposium. Um, I'm gonna, we'll get back to the evaluation symposium part in a minute. Those are a lot of words. Um, but, but before I get into that, I wanna first of all acknowledge uh, folks in this room, not that are focused on evaluation and symposiuming, but uh, who are focused on the WIC program, serving some nine million uh, women and children around the country with nutritional needs and who were key in implementing this program change. Um, it's, it's, as I make some remarks here and as I thought about the remarks, uh, it's remarkable the kind of systems change that's represented by that food package change and how it ripples uh, through the industry and through the country. Um, and it's really, a, it's really a pleasure to be able to apply some of our uh, research techniques and those of the colleagues that'll present here uh, to these kinds of problems. Um, in addition to that, uh, in, in getting briefed by Linnea and Lauren and Matt the other day on the attendees, it was remarkable the diversity of the attendees. Not only do we have federal, state, and local program staff from WIC, we've got educators and evaluators, researchers, and policymakers in the food and nutrition space. Uh, and we've, we've also got folks, uh, partners from the food industry, food uh, production and, and distribution industry. So that just illustrates the kind of systemic effects that, um, you know, for those outside WIC and the food and nutrition space might think of it as a simple program change, changing a list of, of food, but it really has ripple effects on an entire supply chain uh, as well as a policy environment. Um, my, my primary job is to thank some people as well, as, as Matt did. I want to thank the folks that are uh, the, the partner organizations that have joined Altarum in, in helping putting on uh, this event today. First of all, the, the National WIC Association, uh, longtime partners with us, I appreciate your help. The Association of State and Territorial Public Health Nutrition Ed Directors, um, I'm getting into words now. The, uh, the Healthy Eating Research Program, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation National Project. Also two federal agencies uh, that uh, are, are critical in this domain who have contributed to the planning and the presentation development. Uh, two organizations out of USDA, the Economic Research Service and uh, the Food and Nutrition Service out of CDC, the Division for Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity. And uh, as Matt did, I also want to thank the folks that, uh, that worked hard uh, up, through, uh, up through last night uh, putting all of this together. Special thanks to the team, both of Altarum staff as well as representatives from our partner organizations and federal agencies that participated in the content committee. Uh, there are 22 individuals named on page three within your program, so I'd, I'd encourage you to open it up and take a look. You'll see some fill your names. And if you were part of that, uh, that planning committee and you're present, I'd love for you to stand up and be recognized by, by everyone that's here. It's our fitness break. Everybody stand up. Thank you. It's a lot of hard work, and I think it's going to be reflected in what you hear today. It's a terrific program. Uh, Matt mentioned a little bit about CHOMP, uh, one of our mission projects, and, and the Mission Projects Initiative and Altarum. So what's up with mission projects and, and why our interest at Altarum in the food package policy change? Um, Matt uh, graciously referred to it as my money, um, if only. Um, the, uh, as CEO um, and in our Mission Projects Initiative, I act as the client. Now, I think that that was because they wanted to keep me out of the, doing the actual work, but, uh, but I represent the Institute and the Institute's board in funding these initiatives and helping scope them initially and oversee them and hopefully transition them to, to greater scale and impact. But while I'm giving thanks to folks that helped put this on, I do feel obligated, per Matt's com comments, to, to pay tribute to the vision and to the generosity of Altarum's Board of Trustees. Uh, they've been an integral partner with me in the systems change, if you will, that Altarum has undergone over the last four to five years. Uh, and one of the key aspects of that transformation was stepping up to forward funding, which means putting the money out without external support, uh, this, the Institute's ambitious strategic research and demonstration agenda. 
That commitment has steadily risen over the last few years to its current level, which we sustain at approximately $7 million a year. So it's, uh, it's not an insignificant amount of investment in programs like these, and we're being rewarded because of the honor of doing this great work and being able to partner like this. It's exactly the vision that the, the board and I had for these kinds of projects. Now, key among these investments of, as part of our research and demonstration agenda is the Mission Projects Initiative that Matt referred to. In it, we attempt to complement our internally funded uh, some more basic research activities and our client-driven program work with community and agency partnerships to plan and execute on the ground systems change efforts and we try to support them with, with technical assistance, evaluation, and other kinds of program support. CHOMP, um, the Childhood Obesity Mission Project is one of these three mission projects. The other two focus, I have to give them equal time uh, as I'm the client of all of them, uh, focus on developing an integrated system of care in terms of social and health services for returning vets. We're doing large pilot programs in San Diego and in San Antonio. And the other program is uh, helping federally qualified health centers, CHCs, innovate in their clinical and business practices. And we're doing that in four FQHCs around the country. Back to CHOMP. Uh, from the beginning, Matt and his co-director, Amy, that he referred to and I, wanted to forge a multi-sectoral approach for all of our mission projects, but for CHOMP in particular. Um, it was an obvious choice to, to leverage Altarum's expertise resident in Lawrence practice that Matt already referred to. And so while that was an obvious choice, the other part was frankly just great timing. Um, WIC and other federal programs don't implement major changes like this every year. And it, it really just so happened for, from our perspective to have the coincidence of launching this program at a time when this policy change was about to roll out. And Lauren had the vision to, to do an evaluation of some of the impacts and, and, and system consequences uh, of doing this policy change. So we got lucky on the timing. Uh, but evaluating the impacts and these consequences um, of the new food packages is a perfect fit for CHOMP and, uh, and for Altarum. So uh, I think that's, it's fair to give Lauren a lot of credit for having that vision. Uh, lastly, why have a food package, WIC food package uh, symposium? The symposium, as we've already referred to, recognizes that a significant policy change has happened and is moving a major national nutrition program forward in promoting healthy eating uh, while addressing the food assistance needs of low-income women and children. Um, as I mentioned earlier in terms of the ripple effects and the systemic effects, uh, it also has the potential beyond impacting directly the lives of the WIC clients and their families. It also is already beginning to affect the food available to the broader population in communities and in grocery stores and, and the food that is ultimately available in the supply chain from producers and distributors. So it's having exactly that kind of broad-based effect one would, one would ideally hope for. Um, stores across the nation that participate in this program have already made changes through the evidence you'll hear today in the food that they stock and sell, uh, particularly in the smaller stores. And the food industry has started to adjust product formulations and even uh, packaging and, and in some cases the quantity of production of the healthy foods uh, prescribed in the package. So. Um, had we not done an evaluation, had other researchers that are going to present today not done evaluations, it would just be a kind of a, one that we refer to in the research community as sort of a natural experiment. Uh, and often we find retrospectively that we don't take advantage of these things that are happening pragmatically around the country and actually evaluate them. So I think it's important to acknowledge the foresight of those who are going to be presenting today for having seen this as an opportunity to learn and create evidence from a program that was already rolling out uh, and who have documented the impacts of, of this change. It's, uh, it's an important event today and it's likely to be the first of many opportunities to highlight the impacts. I think it's, it's also critical to note that WIC and this program change is potentially a model. Uh, the first of several national programs to move in the direction of promoting uh, uh, increased access to healthy foods. A couple of other changes worth noting, the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Uh, the Institute of Medicine just recently released some recommendations a couple weeks ago uh, to enhance that program, and this really parallels how the WIC program 
launched its changes uh, some, some five years ago now. Also, school-based nutrition programs. While we wait to see the outcome of the Child uh, Nutrition Act reauthorization, uh, we're hoping for positive reforms there that could have the same kinds of effects as this change. And then lastly, um, I want to highlight WIC's dual role of not only addressing food assistance needs, but also in educating and supporting families and adopting uh, healthy eating behaviors. Um, really with this rollout and successful implementation of this food package, the educational messages and the food that comes through the food packages are now in sync in that regard, addressing not only nutritional needs, but also beginning to be a tool in addressing obesity and promoting child health. Um, with, with implementation of the new food package, um, WIC really is, I think, stepping up to, to its long-term 35-year opportunity to influence child health in, in a terrific way. And lastly, um, I think in terms of a symposium, I think this is almost definitional. definitional. I hope that the evaluation uh, findings shared today will help us identify areas for continued improvement. Um, obviously to systems, to policies at all levels, pro professional development uh, for all of us, uh, training of vendors, market innovations, client, in, in a client education, and of course research. Um, thank you again, all of you, for being here early. We got here on time. The room is full, and we've got a terrific program. So thanks a lot. Appreciate the opportunity to say good morning. Uh, thank you, Link, for your comments and for, for being here with us today for this event. At this time, I want to invite the moderator and the speakers for the first panel to join me up here, assemble up on the stage. Um, and as they assemble, I, um, something occurred to me that, this morning that I wanted to share, and that's an observation that next week will be the third anniversary of the release of the interim final WIC food package rule. Um, so it's been three years since that rule was published in December 2007. And at the time, I was uh, a state WIC director in California, and I can remember, you know, with all of my colleagues, many of you in the room, kind of the, the excitement of finally having a long-awaited opportunity to really make enhancements to the foods that we provide for the program, but also the sense of overwhelm. Like, this is an incredibly complex change to make. And, you know, as I think about the past three years, um, you know, we did it. The, the, the WIC program was able to very successfully make these important changes. So today, in a way, is a bit of a celebration of kind of a three-year uh, period from the point in time we had the opportunity to make the changes on through making them. And now, uh, a year post-implementation, we get the chance to not only celebrate that, but also start to hear about some of the impacts of those changes, impacts that I think we were all hoping uh, would, would occur as we had the opportunity to make changes. We're going to start with presentations first. Our first panel, I think very appropriately, is going to be focused on the impact of the changes on the participants, the families that we serve through the WIC program. You'll find copies of slides of these presenters and all presenters in your folder, so you do have those available to um, uh, look at and, and take notes if you choose as they present. The moderator for our first panel is the Reverend Douglas Greenaway, who is the uh, Executive Director of the National WIC Association. And Douglas and the National WIC Association played a major role, uh, not only in advocating for the WIC food package changes, but also in supporting states through the implementation activities that had to happen nationwide. So please join uh, Reverend Douglas Greenaway and our panel of speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linnea. It's a real privilege to be here with you all this morning. I want to say that I am very proud of the partnership uh, that we have, uh, Mr. Smith, with Altarum. Um, I, I wouldn't want to accuse uh, Altarum of of corporate rating. However, I am honored to say that a number of our former National WIC Association members and WIC community uh, um, providers are now part of uh, Altarum. Um, Lauren Bell, whom you've all 
heard uh, spoken of briefly, a former president of the National WIC Association, Linnea Salek, the former chair of our food package uh, committee, the implementation committee, uh, Doris McGuire with the Navajo Nation formerly, um, a nutrition coordinator on that committee uh, and on the original committee that helped to formulate um, our proposed changes, uh, Karen Bertram um, from California, Diane Phillips, the newest member from California, and Karen Dehe from Massachusetts. So we have a close relationship, and I'm really pleased with that. Um, we're very proud of the program that I have the great privilege of advocating for, the WIC program. And our slogan is, your child has you and you have WIC. Feed them well, love them lots. We seek to respond to the mother and child's nutrition, health, and social needs in a very holistic way. And I can say with some certainty that our WIC providers are quite successful at achieving that end. The National WIC Association is a non-governmental organization. It's the voluntary nonprofit arm, education and advocacy arm, serving the 12,200 state and local agency service providers and um, the nine million mothers and children who now participate in the program. We've come a long way since this program was founded in 1972 as a pilot project, went national in 1974, and after 35 years, um, we are now serving over 9 million mothers and kids. It's really amazing how the program has grown. When you think of it, we started with $20.6 million. We're now funded over $7.2 billion. Amazing growth and change. Before 2009, our WIC food packages included array, an array of foods that were established in 1974 along with the program's inception. Um, and to give you uh, some sense of the kind of foods that were in the food package, and I know many of you from, from who are service providers remember these foods quite fondly. Um, iron, uh, fortified infant formula, infant cereal, milk, eggs, cheese, peanut butter, um, dried beans and peas, 100% vitamin C juices, iron fortified cereals, tuna fish, and carrots. That was basically the extent of our food packages. Well, we have certainly made some significant changes. Since the program's inception, there have been demographic changes. Um, new nutrition science has emerged. Obesity epidemic has become a major public health concern. Diet-related chronic diseases have increased. And changes in the dietary pattern and food supply have been observed. In 2000, the National WIC Association recommended in its paper, food pa WIC food package pre prescription recommendations, including fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and fiber-rich foods. Reduction in the fat content of the overall food packages and in specific food items. Provision of balanced food packages that are consistent with the dietary, current dietary guidelines, inclusion of a greater variety of nutrient-dense foods, increasing state flexibility to tailor food packages to reflect cultural and regional dietary patterns of participants. And in 2003, we published a paper called Cultural Sensitive Food Prescription Recommendations that urged food packages that would address the cultural needs of WIC's increasingly diverse uh, participant population. We all know that eventually the Institute of Medicine, with the urging and advocacy of the National WIC Association and others in this room and with the support of USDA, became the contracting agent to formally review the WIC food packages. And as Linnea shared in 2007, they published their results. And now here we are, one year after implementation, with new food packages. And it's now my privilege to introduce our panelists, who will share something of um, the WIC food packages and their evaluation. Um, our, and I'm going to go my left to the end of the table. Uh, Dr. Shannon Whaley and the biographies, there's a comprehensive biography, biography in your program, so I invite you to turn to those. So briefly, Dr. Shannon Whaley, who is Director of Research and Evaluation at the Public Health Foundation Enterprises WIC program and a National WIC Association member. Um, her expertise is in planning, development, and evaluation of programs designed to optimize the healthy development of children and families served by WIC. Um, 
Dr. Sally Findlay, who is professor of the Heilbronn Department of Population and Family Health, Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, has focused on promoting child health through multi-pronged community-based interventions. And Jennifer Poole, who is a policy associate at Altarum Institute, um, is the lead analyst for a multi-year evaluation of the impact of changes to the WIC food packages on participant redemptions. And she has extensive experience working with both WIC administrative and redemption data at point of sale data for, from WIC vendors. And so please join me in welcoming our panelists and Dr. Shannon Whaley. Thank you for coming. For those of you from California, I think it's after 6 a.m. now. So I hope the coffee is settling in. I'll be talking to you about the study we did out in California. Uh, you all know the topic. It's why we're here today. So let me take you out to California, give you a little sense of what, how we do WIC there. We have 84 local agency WIC programs in California. We serve 1.4 million of the 9 million uh, national WIC participants out in California in over 700 WIC sites. Our smallest local agencies serve about 500 people per month, and our largest, which is where I'm from, PHFE WIC serves over 300,000 participants a month. Uh, as you might guess, we're in Los Angeles, big city. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about our NFP study design, and I forgot to spell out what NFP means, and so I'll tell you. It's the Nutrition Education and Food Package Impact Study. So I'm going to call it NFP from now on because that's really too long to keep saying. And what we did was phone surveys of random samples of 3,000 California WIC participants. So I wanna walk you through this slide because it's important to recognize the study designs. Our time one survey was back in March of 09. So it was before any participant, any WIC participant had sort of heard that the new package was coming. And it was just when we were starting to teach our staff that there was a new food package coming in six months. So we did a survey of 3,000 California WIC participants before we did anything. Then we did a six month long education campaign, nutrition education campaign. I'll give you a little more detail about what that campaign was. And we really got our participants um, noticing that come October 1st, we changed in California on October 1st, um, that there would be the upcoming changes to the food package and what they would involve. And we did our time two survey then right before the change to the checks. So they had received nutrition education, but they hadn't yet received the checks with the ability to buy the new foods. Then six months later, we went ahead and did a third wave. This was then six months after implementation in California. So those are our three waves. We had a terrific team. Uh, many are here today. Uh, our friends from Berkeley couldn't make it, Lorene Ritchie. Uh, Field Research Corporation is who we worked with to actually conduct the surveys. And our California WIC program, we have a number of people here, uh, and PHFE WIC. So those were our team. We then did cross-sectional random samples of 3,000 participants. We, we wanted to do a gorgeous longitudinal design and follow people, and do we all know what that costs? <laughs> it costs a lot. So this still did cost quite a bit, and this was the way to, um, to be able to do it in a manageable budget. We did the surveys out in California in English and Spanish. 98% of our WIC participants in California speak English or Spanish. Oh, dear. And uh, what's important is that the callers were blind to the research aims. We contracted with Field Research Corporation in San Francisco to make the calls, which means that we handed over data to an outside agency with a name and a phone number, and you have to believe that made us all a little edgy at first. The way we handled it was to only send the first name and the phone number. Um, so uh, basically, the field research had about two people who knew how to link a first name and a phone number. All the callers out in the sites then, uh, in the field research sites, had auto dialers, so they actually weren't dialing the numbers. They just knew they were calling Maria somewhere in California, who was a WIC participant. So we really did, we were very pleased with the way we could protect client confidentiality and still do a survey with an outside research firm, because we think it does lend credibility to the study to not have WIC calling WIC families, but to have a research firm calling WIC families. We had really nice cooperation rates. When you reach a WIC mom at home, she seems just delighted to talk to you for 20 or 25 minutes, it was lucky. And our response rates were around 50% because a lot of our moms, in fact, aren't home. So we tried eight to 10 times to reach those families. If you'd like the survey, if you're like me and you love to go look at surveys, here's the website. So our healthy habits education, you can see who we were involved with, and I know many, of other, many other states, and thanks to NWA with their association with the Sesame Workshop, 
we went ahead and worked with Sesame Workshop and did a statewide education, education campaign for staff and participants. We gave out this Get Healthy Now um, DVD to every family. So, Linnea, I think you purchased a million of these um, for all the WIC families. And we did the same education to all California WIC participants that summer. So April and May, there was two months of education on fruit and vegetables. June and July, focused on lower fat milks. August and September focused on whole grains. And for those of you who are really education focused, the state has put together a gorgeous website with all their materials. And I would encourage you to go to that website if you'd like to see more about what the education campaign was. You know the foods of focus. Don't have to spend much time on this slide. Who is surveyed? This is our California WIC participant, participants. Obviously most of them are women. Um, age was about 29 years. Average household size around, set, around five, and the time on WIC was just less than four years. Out in California, we are mostly Hispanic, so you see 81% of those that we called were Hispanic, with about 58% of those preferring Spanish. And just like our population, these are mostly mothers of infants and kids. We know that our largest chunk of our pie is our infants and our children. We also, though, did survey breastfeeding moms and pregnant moms. This is how the education breaks down in California, meaning the education of the caregiver. So about half have less than 12 years of education. I think the reason this is important to always keep in our minds is that nutrition education is really a core part of WIC. It really makes us stand out from other programs. And it's helpful to recognize the level of education of the people we're serving, so we direct those efforts most appropriately across the spectrum. So here's your reminder about the design, because we're gonna go into the bars, the bar charts, and I want you to remember which bar refers to which time period. So time one, remember before anything. Time two is after education, but before the check change. And time three is after the check change. Starting <clears throat> with fruits and vegetables, the light blue bars are always gonna be time one and the dark blue bars are always gonna be time two. So this slide is showing you the impact of nutrition education alone. We haven't given them the cash value voucher yet. But we saw from just the education efforts significant increases in family consumption of fruits just from education. As you see from this, we didn't see significant increases from education alone on consumption of vegetables, but here's time three. Time three is always gonna be this purple color. We saw an additive, more of an effect of, on fruit consumption. Once we gave the check, fruit consumption went up even more, and now we have vegetables. So once we gave the cash value voucher, vegetable consumption did go up. And I would love to speak with some of you in this room who are doing this kind of research about this very issue. Uh, one of the things we're wondering out in California, so we'd like to know if it's true in your states, is, is fruit sort of more amenable to education efforts than vegetables? So you can give an education message about cutting up fruit and leaving it in the fridge, making it easy for kids to eat, and families seem to be able to respond to that. This is sort of the way we're interpreting these data. But vegetables seem a bit harder. They don't seem as easy to, behave, to change behavior with, nutri with nutrition education alone, but very powerful once you give them the check. Once we give them the ability to buy it, we do see behavior change. Next is milk. In California, we do allow 2%. And I know some of you in this room are from states like New York who went straight to 1% being the max. We do allow 2%. And from education alone, we saw really nice drops in whole milk and increases in lower fat milk. And remember, this is before we changed the checks. So they still could purchase the whole milk up to through time two, which is the blue bar. What I think is also nice to see, uh, the bars on the left are the type that the respondent consumes, so the mom. And we saw changes both for mom and child. And remember that 75% of these moms aren't on WIC themselves anymore. So we see the behavior change in the respondent even though she's actually not getting WIC checks anymore because she's not pregnant or breastfeeding or postpartum. Time three, really, I mean this is for all of you evaluators in the room, you know you love stair steps when you have your two levels of intervention. So it was just delightful to see significant impact of nutrition education alone and another big significant impact of changing the check. So we see nice reductions in whole milk consumption and very nice increases in low-fat milk consumption. And the whole grains. We were shocked to see a significant, small but significant increase in whole grain consumption from education alone. I say we're shocked because we all know whole grains is a little bit harder than fruits and vegetables and milk. I mean, fruits and vegetables, it's sort of easy to talk to participants about that. You know what those are. 
It's very easy to, to define. It's very easy to define what a low-fat milk is. You know, trying to define a whole grain opens up a huge amount of possibilities. So before we changed the checks and we were doing our education during the summer, we had a lot of talking about label reading and the first ingredient needs to be whole grain. And it was, I would say, a more abstract concept than eat more fruits and vegetables, eat your colors, eat a rainbow, um, and you know, lose the fat, keep the vitamins. Those messages just were easier than this whole grain message. So we were surprised and delighted to see some effect of education, but what's really powerful is the effect once you give them the ability to buy the food. Once you give them the check, huge increases in people's um, consumption of the whole grain foods. So again, we find that very compelling evidence that these provision of new checks really does change participant behavior. Satisfaction was a whole other thing. So thank you. Um, lots of people are wondering, do they like this new package? So we asked, do you like this new package? You'll see here that very many of them are very or somewhat satisfied with the new foods, the education, the checks for fruits and vegetables, the checks for whole grains, and the checks for only lower fat milks. We then asked about those things that got reduced because we all know that this change had to be cost neutral, so to add the new foods, we had to take some things out. So the things we took out are those items on the bottom. And you see here that there's a little bit more dissatisfaction there when we talk about those foods that they used to get more of, and now they're getting less of. So um, Debbie Whitford, she's actually in the room, she had the idea and said, well, what about the people who are new since October? So the people who never knew it the old way. So we called them the veterans, the old were the veterans, and the new were the new, because we didn't want to call them old, of course. So when we look at the veterans compared to the new participants, here we see that the satisfaction with those things that got reduced is significantly higher than the satisfaction of the veterans who knew it the old way, which I really think suggests that as time marches forward, which is I think all it's going to do, and we lose folks who didn't know it the old way, satisfaction will continue to go in an upward direction. So, and you see from the top that there's no significant differences in how they feel about the new, the new foods. So in conclusion, I think an important point, you know, as I said earlier, and I think all of us Wikis in the room know, nutrition education at WIC is a huge part of what we do. It's very important. We really feel that it sets apart WIC. Um, it really makes us stand out. And what we feel we found is that the healthy habits education was associated with increases in recognition of the education messages and reported increases in fruit, low-fat milk, and whole grains. We did publish this already in the Journal of Nutrition Education and Behavior, the special WIC issue. Um, so that's already out. So nutrition education in WIC can change participant knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors, supporting the consumption of a healthier diet. And the new food package improves diets. I think we can say that very conclusively from the data in California, that it supports consumption of a healthier diet with increases in fruits and now vegetables, lower fat milk, and whole grains. And we've had now submitted this um, second paper for publication. We also can say we have high satisfaction. California WIC participants report very high satisfaction with the new package. And remember, participants new to the program since the change have higher satisfaction than those who knew things the old way. So I think this really points to a, an exciting future for WIC. And a, I really embrace it. We all love it. We're us frontline people. And the, I think this is, without doubt, my most important slide. I think many of us in this room today feel like we're here as the voices of probably thousands of people in our states, at least hundreds, who are the frontline WIC staff who really made this change possible, made it effective, embraced it, ran with it. Um, so I really want to thank them, in my case, the frontline staff in California, but I think all of you here have your frontline staff to thank for these changes being so successful. Uh, Lorraine Ritchie, Phil Spector, and Pat Crawford at Berkeley. Linnea is here in the room today. She was our WIC director when we did this study, had great vision to get it done. Um, and then Nancy Crocker and Michelle Van Eiken is our new WIC director, also in the room today. Judy Gomez, Eloise Jenks, Nellie Mayo, Mike Whaley, Mark DiCamillo, and Lori True. So I want to thank those people. Um, it's really, I'm just the voice for a big group. So please contact us if you're interested, and I look forward to talking with you more. Well, we always think that New York is a big WIC program, but unfortunately, following California, uh, we don't feel quite as big, but we're still pretty big. <laughs> um, so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to be here and share with you some of the preliminary results from our First Steps Evaluation Project 
Um, some of my collaborators are here in the room. Tim Mooney is sitting there, Jackson Sacobo, Marianne Chasson, and others who you see in the slide who are not here, part of whom are at uh, Columbia University, where I am, and part are at Public Health so Solutions, where Mary Ann Chasson is, and part are at DOH, which is where Jackson and Tim are. So let's see. Which, which button do I do? You do this one. On this right. one, okay. So today I'm going to introduce you to the New York State WIC program. I'm going to briefly present a logic model which we developed to help us understand how we could systematically structure our evaluation so that we would make sure we covered what we wanted to cover. I'm going to describe then in some detail the methodology that is used in the first step study to evaluate the impact of WIC on obesity prevention. And then I'll present some of the preliminary results. Okay, so this is a map of where the WIC uh, agencies are located. As you can see, they're all over the state. Um, our average monthly caseload is roughly half a million, and they're broken up, um, as you can see, uh, uh, roughly half are children, a quarter infants, and a quarter women. The average monthly caseload is not as big as you, the largest one in California, but we still think that roughly 45,000 is pretty big. Um, and the smallest is 72, and uh, three quarters of the cases are actually in the New York City metropolitan region. So New York State has been working for quite a while, as you can see in California also, to develop its approach to the new WIC. And you can see starting way back in 1995, actually, 1997, we had Eat Well, Play Hard. We began to work on introducing vegetables and fruits with the Just Say Yes campaign. We launched pilots of Fit WIC starting in 2005. We uh, explored different kinds of breastfeeding promotion. And I think Tim and his, his whole team have been uh, extraordinary in developing a pilot approach, which is for an evaluator, it's the most wonderful thing to, to see that it's not fixed in concrete, that, there re that there's really this flexibility, what works and, and what is gonna be um, something that we wanna keep going forward. You can see that in 2008, at the bottom of this slide, that that's when the um, checks for low and non-fat milk were actually introduced. Um, and in 2009, January, New York rolled out the new food package. So there were lots of changes. And Tim and his colleagues said, well, wh where is this going? What are we doing with all this? So they came to us at Columbia and Public Health Solutions to put together a, an, an evaluation program. And we sought funding. We got funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the New York State Health Foundation, and of course, New York State Department of Health is, is putting in some money. Um, we have what we call a learning model to our approach because we think um, even though Columbia and Public Health Solutions are themselves outside agencies conducting the field work, that we still need to involve the WIC staff and the WIC vendors. We need to learn from them they, if they ask the questions, they're going to listen to the answers. So we involve them in the development of all of our research tools, and we also include them in, in the research itself, as well as, of course, the caregivers. So our approach to evaluating impact is that we assess changes over time, not just one year. And we want to be able to also control for that exposure to WIC. As Shannon and all of you know, um, w people are in WIC for varying periods of time. They may start when they're pregnant. They may not start when they're pregnant. So we want to be able to control for that. We want to assess both behavioral and health outcomes, not just did they increase consumption of different items. And we want these program lessons to be really meaningful so it can continue to build the strength of the WIC program in New York. Da da We need some kind of framework to make sure that we really are covering all that. So we developed what I call the optimistic model. And I'm not going to try to explain this whole model to you because there's too many words on that page. It's in your, in your handouts, I think. 
Um, but the orange boxes in there are really what we actually are focusing on and will cover in every step of our evaluation. But let me simplify it for you. And for some of you who are following with the handouts, I did a little bit of last minute tweaking, so it's not quite the same order that you'll find. Um, the, so our simplified model, it, you start at the, with the inputs. There's money, it allows to have a WIC program. Uh, there is outreach to, from the local WIC agencies that helps people know about WIC. Uh, and we also don't want to forget about those other things, the uh, child care assistance programs, Head Start. WIC does not operate in a vacuum, and especially when you get to the child of age two through five, a lot of them are in day, daycare and Head Start. So we want to pay attention to all those things. The outputs, we want to see who gets enrolled. We want to see if they're, they're participating, if they're receiving, and the, they're using their WIC checks. Then the intermediate outcomes, that's the awareness changes of the caregivers, their understanding about the healthy foods and the activities that they could do with their children, enhanced self-efficacy that they actually can make these changes, their satisfaction with WIC, their participation and continued participation, re-enrolling, recertifying their children. Then the long-term outcomes, we, we always think of the very bottom here, the reduced overweight and obesity, but there are all these other things here which improve the linkage to preventive care, the behavioral changes which spread throughout the family, and the caregiver and behavioral impacts. So I'm a sociologist, so I like some of these big words here. Triangulation is one of them. I really think that if you have a study that is backed up and paralleled by another study with a slightly different methodology, you're going to learn more than if you just did one study. So we've built into our approach a tri triangulation. First, it's a pre-post design where we're looking at what was going on before the new WIC food package was rolled out, as Shannon has described for you in, in California. California, then post WIC, but we're going to continue it semi-annual for three years post implementation of those WIC changes. Multiple views. We want to hear from the WIC caregivers, WIC staff, the WIC vendors, multiple methodologies, both qualitative and quantitative, with focus groups, with surveys, and we also want to use our WIC SIS data. Now, New York has a completely um, electronic database that has all the records for all of the people enrolled in WIC. So we have been able to slice that into six month periods and then we're looking at it both in a cross-sectional perspective and we've constructed a longitudinal cohort which is going to enable us to look at it over time. Layered into this, we also know that the best lessons don't necessarily come from the middle of the road. You want to learn what is really going on, at the sites that are doing very well, and you want to understand what's not working at the sites that aren't. So in our sampling, we are oversampling those places that did very well prior to the rolling out the new WIC program and those who did not so well. So, this is just a summary of the key outcomes that we're looking at the, in terms of the WIC staff and vendors, their adherence to program delivery, their ability to, to promote the use of these products, um, parent caregiver outcomes, and of course the child outcomes. Um, so now let me go into a little more detail about what we're starting to find, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more of the story about low-fat milk. Um, as you can see, in 1995, the New York State WIC program began promoting non- and low-fat milk for children over age two and above and for women. 2007 through 2008, WIC implemented what's known as a booster campaign. Just like California had healthy habits, we had moved to 1% as a campaign to really help everybody understand about the importance of low-fat milk. January 2008 was when the whole package was rolled out complete with the checks, and 2009 it was added to as a strong element within client-centered counseling. So when we did our staff interviews and the focus groups, we talked to WIC staff, and they said, 
we've done demos, demonstrations on how to use this. We've shown people how to use it in serial. And they all agreed in across all these focus groups that one-on-one -on -one counseling, the client-centered counseling helped most. And you can see here what some of the, the staff said, that if you really talk to them and explain about the health benefits, they're going to start to get it. So what did the vendors say? The vendors said, well, we still have a few problems with these low-fat milk checks. They had carried 2%, so adding 1%. The supply side wasn't a problem. But they felt caught in the middle because a lot of the caregivers still wanted 2%. And here they were. Actually, it's sometimes the vendors had to do a switch at checkout to say, no, you have to get the non-fat. You can't get the 2%. But... They said also in the focus groups that resistance appeared to be going down over time as more participants get used to the low-fat milk. So what did the WIC participants have to say? They said, hmm, we don't really like it. Some of them said this, and this comes through the focus groups. It's hard to get my two-year-old to drink it after they've been drinking whole milk. Um, those of you who are in the WIC field, You've heard, you hear this all the time, so this is not new. But what we do see coming through in the focus groups is that many do report that they get used to it. And the quote at the bottom here, which I'm not going to read, is one of those typical quotes we heard in the, in the focus groups that at first it was hard, but now we all, all drink this milk. So were these focus groups unusual? No. When we went to the WIC-SYS data, you can see, and these are all significant differences, in the three-year-olds, you can see that the consumption went from pre-rollout um, to the 2010 period, from 71% to 78% among three-year-olds, and in four-year-olds from 75 to 84%. The, the lack of change, and in fact, the reduction that we see that we is mirrors what the focus groups are saying, that it's hard to get it on the two-year-olds. So you, we see we have to still work, but be patient that changes are going to happen. So where are we with vendor feedback on the new package? The, the vendors really like the new food package. They say it's good for customers, it's good for business. They're selling brands that people really want. But they had problems with some of the things like the whole wheat foods, uh, the bread supply in New York wasn't quite right and people had a hard time getting it. And the small stores, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear more about that later, small stars, stores sometimes have real issues with displays. Um, but the participants really like the fresh fr vegetables and fruits, and they prefer the fresh to the frozen and the cans, and they say things like, my daughter loves the fruits and vegetables, she'd rather have them than candy. There's some difficulty in actually getting the exact $6 amount that the check requires, but vendors are helping them get weighed. it. So we're also seeing increases in daily vegetable and fruit con uh, consumption for one to five-year-olds. And again, these differences are all significant. Um, we are looking at more than the, the food package changes. We're seeing uh, also looking at some of the behavioral changes. Everybody says God, changing TV viewing, getting people out to play is very hard. And we are seeing a slight increase in a, a slight increase in the number of children who are watching two hours or less of TV <laughs> or screen time. Uh, but that caregivers still say it's very hard to get the kids out to play. So we still have some challenges with FITWIC. In our caregiver survey, we said, found that 43% said it was hard to get their children out. And 50% of the two to five-year-olds are playing half an hour or more inside but in front of the TV, which our physical exercise specialist says that's not going to get them active very, very much. So what are the lessons learned from our First Steps preliminary evaluation? The staff and the participants agree that participant-centered counseling is more effective than lecturing. This is a big, important factor in how they receive all these changes. At 18 months, we are, in fact, beginning to see an uptake of the new food package elements, specifically low-fat milk, vegetables, and fruits. Changing lifestyles is a little more of a long-term proposition, but even here, the data suggests that we're starting to see some changes. In the coming year, our surveys 
and our focus groups are going to focus more on those FITWIC elements so that we can get a better idea of how all of those behavioral recommendations are playing out. The big lesson that we have is that implementing the new food package is a partnership between WIC staff and WIC vendors. And evaluation is likewise a partnership between WIC staff and WIC vendors. We need everybody's perspectives to really understand how it's working and how we can make it work even better. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. All right, there is my slide. All right. Um, we um, took a slightly different approach, and I know we're a little bit behind, so I'm going to try not to go too fast, but um, try and get through this fairly quickly. Um, this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, quickly going over the purpose of the study and the methods, and spending more time on our results and the summary of our findings. Um, so we took a very different approach to looking at um, participant acceptance of the food package changes, um, which I'll talk about in the methods. Um, but we also talked to WIC participants um, and you know, gathered their input um, about their acceptance in addition to our quantitative analysis. Um, and we also wanted to describe the food choices that people are making um, with the new additions to the food packages um, and the new choices that are available. I'm going to talk very little about that in order to keep this a 15-minute presentation, um, but we're happy to talk about those things afterward if anyone is interested. So... We partnered with the Wisconsin WIC program in early 2008 um, through a cooperative agreement funded by the Economic Research Service of the USDA. Um, so in early 2008, we um, began this process, um, this very long process, um, to meet Wisconsin's implementation date of August 1st. So we used a repeated cross-sectional study design, um, looking at baseline data from immediately prior to the food package change implementation, then six months post-implementation, and right now we're in the midst of our 12 months post-implementation data analysis, which is very exciting. Um, and this winter um, we'll be getting our 18 months data. And we used both quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, the quantitative approach we took uh, involves data from the WIC program, so many of you I'm sure are familiar with that, demographic data, um, race and ethnicity, age, food package type, uh, and the information about the food instruments themselves. Um, so the foods that are prescribed, the quantities and amounts um, participants are able to purchase with those food instruments. And the second half of the equation here is the store level data, or the point of sale data. We actually collected from the WIC vendors the actual foods people are purchasing with their food instruments. And the reason we did this is because to gain the benefits of the food package changes, people need to purchase and consume the foods that they're prescribed. Um, now, we don't get into the consumption part, however, we are able to see which foods um, people are purchasing with their food instruments, if they're purchasing any foods. Um, so, our store sample includes 44 stores throughout Wisconsin. It's a non-representative sample, um, but we tried to focus on um, collecting uh, or recruiting stores that were in rural and urban areas and um, had a broad distribution throughout the state. And also we tried to get some um, non-chain stores. Uh, still all of the stores are full, um, full service grocery stores. So about 6% of the WIC redemptions in both the pre and six months post um, are covered by these 44 stores, and that includes about 20,000 food instruments for both time periods, which is not a small amount of data. Um, so the findings I'm going to go over include state-level redemptions, which are really um, the entire WIC population and their use or non-use of the traditional food instruments and their use of the CVVs. 
the store level redemptions, we'll look at um, the traditional food instruments and what people are purchasing, whether or not they're purchasing, and then the CVVs, uh, the cash value vouchers, um, which is actually at the family level, and I'll talk very briefly about that in a few minutes. So here are the results um, from baseline six months and 12 months post-implementation um, for redemption of food instruments overall. Now, this is the entire WIC population, so we don't know if they bought one gallon of milk off that check or everything, but this gives a pretty good picture of um, what's going on overall. Uh, you, we can see there's very little change in the percentage of people who are buying all, or using all of their food instruments, about 75%. However, we can see, I don't have a laser pointer here, I don't know if I'd be able to use it. Um, but we can see an increase from baseline of six months in people not using any of their food instruments for that month um, of about 3%. And then that decreases a little bit at 12 months post-implementation. Um, so we looked at these uh, by demographics and we saw that the greatest increases in non-use are among non-Hispanic Black and non-Hispanic American Indian Alaska Natives as well as postpartum and pregnant women. Um, and the reason I wanted to include 12 months post up here is because we've seen, and these are somewhat preliminary, but we've seen a big gain among the non-Hispanic black population in, um, in using their checks again. Um, so we're not exactly sure what's happened, but it looks like um, they're a little bit more likely to use them after 12 months than this drop um, from baseline to six months post. And we can see something similar happening um, with the cash value vouchers. Um, the rates of full, uh, Wisconsin allows split tender. I don't know how many states here do that. So when we talk about a full redemption of a cash value voucher, they use the full $6 amount or $10 amount. Um, and so an under redemption is if you only use $2 or $5.30 or you know, less than that maximum amount. And we can see here that um, about 42% um, at both times are using the, the full amount of the voucher. So they're probably buying more fruits and vegetables um, in that transaction um, than the voucher allows for. Um, so if you combine under redemption and full redemption, it's, a, it's about 77%, a little bit higher than the traditional food instruments. Um, but the non-redemption um, is around 22%, and this is a significant change. Um, we're talking about almost 100,000 people, so pretty much any change is going to be significant. Uh, but again, um, for racial and ethnic groups, the differences are the same as with the traditional food instruments, but it, there's been a bigger gain among non-Hispanic blacks in taking up or using those CVVs at 12 months post. So we're seeing, we're seeing improvement in the right direction. We kind of expected some you know, major differences, but we're happy that it's going in the right direction. Oh. So I'm going to move to the store level um, food instrument redemption. So these are the traditional checks. And I'll remind everyone that these are cross-sectional comparisons. And it's a non-representative sample of WIC participants. However, it's, it's a very large sample of WIC participants. Um, and so we, we're hoping some generalizations might be possible. Um, and I wanted to point out that we exclude formula and supplemental nutrition products. There were some issues with um, data quality uh, that we received from the store, so we had to just cut them out totally. So here is what we saw in, for what people are purchasing in the stores. Now let's keep in mind that these people had to use a check in one of our stores, so they are not part of that group that's not using any checks. They're using at least some checks. Um, and so at baseline, 77% of WIC participants bought every single item per, um, prescribed on their checks in the full amount. If they were prescribed two gallons of milk, 36 ounces of cereal, they bought all of it. 
Um, at six months post-implementation, we see a huge decrease down to 64%. Um, so people are using their checks, but they're not buying everything that's prescribed. And I'm going to get into the individual foods in just a minute. But we dug a little bit deeper, and we excluded whole grains from the analysis. We heard from focus group participants that they're having a lot of trouble finding the whole grains that are the right size. Some of the stores don't have them. Um, and so when we exclude whole grains, we're back up to 73% of people making their full redemptions. Um, so issues with whole grains, either participants not wanting them or um, them not being able to purchase them um, accounts for a lot of that decrease in the full food redemption. And then we looked at, um, or we excluded whole grains and peanut butter and bean um, prescriptions, and that accounted for another about one and a half percent of um, the decrease from baseline to six months post, and I'll get into those in just a minute. When we look at the individual foods, we can see that milk and juice um, haven't changed very much. It's still significant, but um, it's still over 90%, around 95%. Eggs actually increased slightly. Uh, peanut butter and beans, though, uh, we saw a little more of a change. So I'm going to talk about those a little more in depth. Um, about two-thirds of the decrease in uh, peanut butter redemptions is due to not buying anything. So you're prescribed peanut butter, but you choose not to buy it, or you're not able to buy it. Um, and for beans, um, we see a 10% decrease in people who are prescribed beans who are purchasing them. Um, and three quarters of that is due to non-redemption. So, you know, people are prescribed beans and they're either choosing to or not able to purchase them. So we looked at, and I'm sure most of you know, that some food packages are prescribed both peanut butter and beans, and some food packages are prescribed um, the choice between the two. So you can have peanut butter with um, a bean substitution. We uh, looked from pre to post at uh, people who are prescribed both beans and peanut butter. And the dark blue uh, section of the pie shows the full redemption of beans and peanut butter. So at baseline, 66% of people bought both of them in the full amounts prescribed. At six months post-implementation, only 39% of people who were prescribed both took advantage of that benefit. So we kind of see there's something going on here. Um, again, these numbers are relatively small um, at baseline and six months post compared to the full sample. Um, but it, it made us look a little bit closer. Um, so here, and this is the only time I'll talk about what people are choosing to buy when they have options. Um, we see that at six months post-implementation, people are buying more beans than they were at baseline. So this, um, along with the fact that about 50% of people are choosing canned versus dry, kind of indicates that people are pretty happy with their bean options. Um, and so, you know, they're more likely to purchase beans than peanut butter when they're given the option at six months post-implementation. Uh, and here we have six months post, we only have data at six months post for whole grains, obviously. Um, only 79% of people are able to purchase um, the whole grains or choose to purchase the whole grains. And 79% seems high, but I'll just remind everyone that milk, juice, and eggs were all around 95% or higher. Um, so 79% is more than beans, um, but not, still not as high as we would like to see it. Um, so CVVs, really quickly, um, they were underutilized in stores. And by underutilized, I mean people weren't taking the full advantage of the check, so they were um, using less than the maximum amount, uh, which we saw at the state level as well. Um, we heard from participants through the focus groups that they're having trouble using the CVVs at the stores, that some stores won't allow the split tender. Um, and so we looked at um, the maximum amounts 
used in stores by the 44 stores that were in our sample. And there was a huge range of, um, of what people are using in the different stores. In our one end, only 26% of participants used more than the maximum amount. At the other end, it was 66%. Um, so it seems like there may be some um, vendor issues going on, um, or participants don't really understand how to use the voucher. Um, we're not exactly sure, but we will follow up with our focus groups this winter and find out. Um, so, in summary, um, overall, the non-use of WIC benefits increased at the state level, um, and I already told you it was highest among those groups, and there was a low redemption of CVVs overall. Um, and among racial and ethnic groups and food package categories. Um, the, at the store level, we saw a decrease in full purchases, um, which was impacted by the uh, low rates of redemptions for whole grains and the dramatic decrease in bean redemptions. And so the, looking at the decrease in redemptions among um, participants participants issued both beans and peanut butter, and the high rate of substitution for, be for beans for peanut butter, um, we kind of expect that we'd see greater redemption rates because people are happier with their options. Um, so we took a look at the checks that um, people are prescribed, and I expect a lot of you can't see this, uh, but there's it, uh, there's a lot of similarity between the check that issues beans or peanut butter and the check that issues beans and peanut butter. And so we suspect there might be some confusion by participants when you have one check for your child and one check for yourself, you know, which, on which ones you get both and which ones you have to choose, or maybe you've been on the program for a while and you always had to choose, so you're not really taking full advantage. And that is the end of the presentation. I didn't go over too, too long. Thank you. Well, um, now is your opportunity to ask questions of our three panelists. Here's what I garnered from the three presentations. Uh, and you can all correct me if I get it wrong. <laughs> Um, Shannon shared that uh, nutrition education and new food packages have increased consumption of healthy foods, and um, there was increased consumption of whole grains, reduced whole fat consumption, increased low fat consumption, and money is power, increased fruit and increased vegetable consumption. Dr. Findlay shared that there was evidence that New York WIC, cons new York WIC consumers uh, got used to low fat milk, particularly as a child got older. Um, increased uh, daily consumption of fruits and vegetables. Participant-centered nutrition education works better than lecturing. And at 18 months, there was an uptake in new food package elements and implementation and evaluation partnerships are critical. And uh, Jennifer Poole shared that in Wisconsin, they don't like beans, peanut butter, or whole grains. <laughs> Forgive me if I just summed it up in that brief way. <laughs> We need, we need to hold our hands over the folks in Wisconsin. Anyway, um, questions, please, don't be shy. Here's your opportunity to ferret out more information from these three excellent presenters. Tracy Fox. Thank you, Tracy Fox. <laughs> <laughs> President of the Society for Nutrition Education and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So thanks, really interesting. Um, Presentation, Chan and I had a question on the nutrition education intervention. You had mentioned that you had sent DVDs home to the WIC participants. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what else was involved in the nutrition education and if whether or not you assessed that they watched the video, what they did with it, that kind of thing. And I'm, I apologize, I bet this is in your JNEB article, which I will go back and read, but if you could just highlight a couple of the things. Sure. Is this on? Yeah, it is. I'll do my best. I didn't bring the paper with me today, but um, we did look at a lot more about the impact of the, whether they watched the video. I think your first question then is how did we implement and what else did we talk about? Thankfully, I have a couple other Californians here who can remind me as well. 
The, the, fruit, the fruit and vegetable education, that was the first sort of kickoff of the Healthy Habits campaign. We did give the DVD and we talked to mom, we showed it during the class. If there were kids present in the class, it's got this great eggplant singing and broccoli doing kicks in the background. And it's very compelling. I would urge you to, to look at their materials. We did give that, home, give that to every family and ask them to watch it at home. And then the whole class really focused on eating a rainbow, eat your colors, um, sometimes anytime foods. Those were the key, the, the two key messages of the class itself. So if you want real details, it's, it's really all on the website. I can walk you through and direct you to where to find the actual handouts, the learner-centered handout that we gave to participants to take home, et cetera. We did actually look at whether the kids watched it or not. Um, in San Diego, I know a few of you were at that meeting, we had a co-panelist from Sesame Workshop um, David Cohen joined us for that talk, uh, and he really presented a really terrific session on the Healthy, healthy um, Habits campaign. So we did find that, I'm not going to remember the exact numbers, but at over half of families had kids watching it five or more times in the home. And we also found that the families who watched it more did evidence more behavior change. So that's sort of a caveat. The next paper, I guess, is to go back in and look at the specific things having to do with whether they watched it. So they did seem to watch it. Those that did had more behavior change. And the Spanish speakers tended to watch it more than the English speakers, possibly because they don't have other materials available, because it was also, the DVD is in English and in Spanish. Shannon, if I could add to what you're saying, um, my, I'm Michelle Van Eiken with California WIC program. And for our SNE colleagues, I want to say that one thing I feel was really uh, critical was our research earlier that showed that when staff is engaged and enthusiastic, they're the face of WIC. So we spent 10 months, but, uh, six months before the participant campaign getting staff excited, implementing wellness programs. Uh, encouraging walking clubs, salad potlucks, had taste tests of brown rice. Um, by the time we started educating the participants with this campaign, they were really making changes in their own lives and in the lives of their families and could speak very um, enthusiastically to participants. I, I want to add to Tracy and for others in the room, um, the partnership that evolved was a result of the National WIC Association Sesame Workshop coming together to distribute over five million of these products nationally. It included a DVD, as Shannon shared, for the kids. There was a, a, a book that could be read by the parent or the caregiver to the child, and then there were instructions for the parent or caregiver um, to share information in the DVD and in the, um, the book for the child. It, the messages were really simple. Eat a rainbow, sometime food, anytime food. And just so you know how effective this works, a former staff member of ours had a two-year-old child who when the opportunity came to purchase cookies in the grocery store, oh no daddy, that's a sometime food. So it really worked very effectively. Yes? Um, hi, I'm Connie Bish, and uh, I'm with the Mississippi State Department of Health but I'm actually a CDC assigned epidemiologist. So I'm just gonna preface that I'm naive about what I'm gonna ask you, and all of you are probably gonna say, oh, of course we do that, but I don't know this, because mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a researcher. So as I was listening to you talking about the education component, um, the question that kept coming up for me was, in the educational components, is there sort of a way to uh, educate the participants on how to incorporate the WIC prescription into their family food purchasing and um, sort of like if you're on Nutrisystem, you then have to buy extra foods. And so if you're on WIC, uh, how does that actually fit into your family's food budget and your food selections? So you're getting the whole grains and you're getting the fruits and that should be a third of your eating and you should eat these other things. So I don't know and I'm curious, do we actually do that in WIC where we actually sort of give a family uh, dietary uh, prescription, and, and this is the portion of that that comes from this WIC package. What do, you, what, what do you do in New York? I bet all of us in the room could answer that in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts. I think you all can hear me and speak very loud. Uh, <laughs> in Massachusetts, what we did, we had our WIC staff as well as some of our participants 
give us recipes that we could develop that incorporate some of the cultural foods along with the new WIC foods. And many of our WIC local programs had taste testings of these different foods. And the staff and the local uh, and the participants were really enthusiastic about it. And many of the doctors and nurses came in and tried some of the foods too. So we found out when we were able to incorporate what you already purchased culturally and made the minor adjustments with some of the whole grain products especially or fruits and vegetables and vegetables and like things is such a hard issue to get across and incorporating different other um, herbs and things that you can purchase um, on your own because there's some herbs that you cannot purchase in the wood package that we found out there was a significant change and the parents were much more receptive once they were able to see it, taste it, and get an idea and then letting the children do it within, within groups and not having the parents make any facial you know, yeah. discretions or whatever, <laughs> and let the kids get used to seeing and tasting and feeling the foods and feeding themselves. So it was a major impact in having the participant as well as the local work program staff buy into this. Doug, I can speak up. Sally, I think you wanted to share something. Um, I think the other thing that um, I think every state probably um, talks about client-centered counseling in a different way, and I'm not one of the people who's actually doing the educating, but the, what I hear from the staff and from the caregivers is that it's not a question of you've got to do this now for your child. It's an open-ended kind of conversation where the WIC staff is helping the caregiver put this into perspective of her whole family. And it's usually her, so I'm gonna use her. Um, and I think that the demonstrations aren't just about, okay, you can do this with this child who's in WIC, but it's really about, okay, this is how you would use this milk for cereal for your family. Uh, this is the sort of thing you could serve your family with whole grains. So I think that the combination of having the the educational materials, but the fluidity and flexibility that is part of that one-on-one -on -one client centered counseling helps the family, the families who want to go to how do I do this for the whole family, they can go there and the WIC staff is able to support them. What our colleague from Massachusetts has demonstrated is that this room has a wealth of expertise. All the experts are not just up here on the panel, and so I hope you take the opportunity to network work with each other because there is just an amazing amount of information in this room. Dr. Bish, the, your Mississippi colleagues speak very highly of you and your contributions to the program, so thank you. Uh, Jerry Henshey. Thanks, Doug. Well, thank you so much for these excellent presentations. I wanted to follow up, Jennifer, on the really interesting data that you showed on redemptions as it relates to fruits and vegetables. And when I think back to the map, it looks like for some of these um, families, they don't really have a choice where they shop. I mean, they're rural areas. So if they're going to stores that aren't going to allow them to use split tender for fruits and vegetables or offering poor quality, it looks like they can't really change where they're going to. So I guess I have two questions around your findings on the fruits and vegetables. One, did the state of Wisconsin feel they could do anything about the fact that these stores weren't allowing split tender when the state said that they could, or some of the quality issues? And two, since there are issues in a decline in participation that's been a particular problem in Wisconsin, did you see a connection between the inability to really use the fruit and vegetable vouchers at some of these stores and participation rates in those areas? Thanks. Okay, there are a lot of questions there. Um, we didn't look at participation rates, so I can't answer that question. Um, the stores on the map were our sample stores. Um, so there are quite a few more stores people can shop at. Um, so when we talk about the state level redemptions, um, we're not sure what stores uh, people are under utilizing their CVVs at. Um, it's definitely something that could be looked at, um, but wasn't really within the scope of our study. Uh, when we talk about our store level analysis, um, when, we, when we have CVV data, it means somebody used their checks. Um, so we, we can look um, for those 44 stores at, you know, who, where are you more likely to use the full six dollars. Um, it's not something we've really tried to do. Um, you know, we, we recruited these stores and told them that, you know, we'd be happy to share, their, share any results for their specific stores with them, but we're not going to rat them out to the state. 
Um, so, so when we see, for instance, that there are a few stores that have really low whole grain redemptions compared to the mean, um, you know, we've tried to get in touch with them and, you know, basically say, look, you know, you, it looks like you're, you're losing a lot of money here by, um, not, because the participants aren't buying these. We don't know if it's because you don't have them, but we thought it might be something you might want to know. Um, and so for CVVs um, specifically, we haven't looked at that by store um, because we've only had, the, the sample of stores that were able to give us CVV data was a bit less than that. I, I want to say half. I'm looking at my colleague. Around half. Um, so it's really two chains um, where, they're, where they're using um, the checks in our sample. Um, and so uh, we, we could definitely look at you know, the mean dollar amount spent at each store, um, but that's not something we've done so far. I just wanted to add in response to the, the telling the state, you know, so they can maybe make some improvements. It would more likely go back in the form of a recommendation that that might be something lacking in their training or that um, vendors aren't quite understanding, so really emphasizing it. Right, a friendly sort of. I, I guess part of what I'm thinking is within Wisconsin, but also I'm thinking larger, you know, in terms of what are best practices overall, what do you see work and not work for other states as well, and also in, in reference to the final rule, given that split tender does seem to be a big issue in how people can implement the fruit and vegetable package, and some states don't allow split tender, so. Thank you. The, the point is a very good one. Um, we recently held a meeting between uh, representatives of the National Week Association and the Food Marketing Institute to talk about this among an, a variety of issues. And we'll be looking to develop some best practices for states to help them ferret out what is the best procedure for clients, the vendor, and for the, for the WIC uh, setting uh, as well. Other questions? Hi, Zoe Newberger with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I have a question for any of you. I'm curious about whether you looked in your research at the extent to which the changes you saw can definitely be associated with changes in the WIC food package or the WIC program even as compared to other things going on in the country. You know, coincidentally, at the time period you were looking at, poverty was increasing, unemployment was increasing, there was a significant increase in food stamp benefits. And I'm wondering if you looked in any way to see whether the, those are factors that I would have expected to have an effect on WIC participant behavior if there had been no changes in WIC. So I'm curious about whether you were able to tease out in any way whether they played a role in what you saw. I'll just say briefly, um, since we looked specifically at point of sale data and the purchases people were making, we expected to see higher redemption rates because of the economy. Um, but other than that, we didn't take into account any other economic factors. As we continue on down the line here. Um, we are definitely looking into looking, considering how we can get at that. We have have a variable in Wixis that does ask about use of other benefits, but we don't think it's very well reported. So we're not so sure that we can really rely on that. And in the the field work that we're now the next next level of survey that we're going to be putting out, we're going to explore using some other alternative questions, um, some of the questions that um, are used nationally to try to get at some of these benefit issues. And it, 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 did, it is going to be a topic of the focus groups in this year. Um, and we are probably going to be we're very mindful that even though we think we have a fabulous design for looking at things over time, it is of WIC beneficiaries. And so we're going to try to add a comparison sample that is of the people not in WIC um, who would be experiencing some of those changes. And the, the third thing that we do in our, in our study is we do have multi-level models that are going to control for where the WIC um, participant lives, whether that is an area where the daycare centers or the Head Starts have had healthy, healthy child in interventions, whether there's something going on in the vicinity of, of that WIC agency with regard to exercise promotion, whether there are other campaigns 
But as you can well understand, the things that we might be able to map are still going to be fairly limited. It's, it's a big challenge for us um, to really demonstrate that WIC has a significant chunk of the action. I think those of us who are in this room believe WIC does have a significant chunk of that action. And I think it's a big challenge on all of us to keep your question in mind. I always love your question, Zoe. Uh, I'm going to try to channel my statistician from Berkeley, and we'll see how lucky I am here. But it speaks also to Sally's point with the regression models, is that we, we did measure um, SNAP participation as well as uh, not income per se. We asked, compared to a year ago, are you making more or less the same? Because we sort of felt like this recession thing was hitting big, actually, at time one. So um, all of that kind of really hit hard as we started the first wave of implementation. So we did ask those questions. And Phil did um, include those in the models. And the fact that they didn't emerge suggests to me that they were stable. But I'll go back and look. Um, and I think actually what had happened is they had changed by time one. So in our, in our peak at this, um, that doesn't seem to be explaining the California study, which was essentially a year, March 09 to March 10, because the the great bad had already kind of hit our families. Um, but I will go back and look at that. We also did um, ask about food security. Uh, so we haven't yet gone back to analyze those data, but we want to link the food security with the SNAP and the uh, perception of income as well as the food uh, behavioral outcomes. Great question, thanks. Yeah, I, I would agree. Zoe, it's a really f wonderful question. You and I have chatted about this uh, on a number of occasions. And anecdotally, I have heard from directors around the country that um, there is concern that the uh, readily uh, the ready accessibility of SNAP benefits and the somewhat more complicated accessibility to um, the WIC program benefits is affecting in some way uh, redemption rates. Um, it's certainly been a concern of the Wisconsin State Director. But it'll be very interesting to see that information that data teased out over time. So thank you, Zoe, for the question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello. Um, first of all, I have a little bit of a sore throat, so we'll try to squawk out this question. But um, this is a question related to whole grain. My name is Tamara Scriver, and I work with the General Mills Bell Institute of Health and Nutrition. And I was interested to see um, the whole grain redemption um, being lower. And um, obviously interested in that from the perspective of a manufacturer and whole grain, but also interested in the perspective of being a, a nutritionist and, you know, really interested in how does, you know, hopefully the food package is at the end of the day delivering three, three servings of whole grain. And so when that, you know, I'm, I'm just interested in your perspective on whether or not you have qualitative data that's, that can give you any information as to why... Um, the food par or the WIC participant might not be redeeming that um, whole grain option. Thanks, Tamara. Jennifer? Um, we heard uh, in the focus groups that people had a really hard time finding the right size whole grain, um, and it seemed like there was a lot of frustration among participants. And, you know, I wonder how much of that has to do with people just not looking anymore. Um, you know, if you have a few food instruments that you're trying to redeem, you've already got a lot of work to do. Um, so, uh, and the differences by store that we saw, I think, too, lend to that theory that stores are having a hard time stocking the 16-ounce loaf of bread. Um, we saw very little brown rice being purchased in our sample stores, which wasn't too surprising. Um, some tortillas, but not, not that many. I think people were really looking for the loaf of whole grain bread. Um, and Stacy, I, I don't remember people saying they didn't want whole grain bread in the focus groups. So yeah, it sounded like people were, were willing to offer it to their kids um, to get them to try it. Lauren? <laughs> yeah, thanks. This, this isn't scientific at all, but we were doing a second project this time. <laughs> And about the time Jim's findings came out. So we said, we're going to be interviewing about 100, 120 participants in Wisconsin. Let's ask them some questions about some of these things just to get an idea where we're headed. So unscientifically, what we heard were two things. One was difficulty finding the whole range of things. That was very clear. The other was we heard from some people, and this was about six to eight months post, I'm just not used to buying bread on wet. I forget that. <laughs> 
and they would go in and they'd say, oh, I didn't get bread this time. Oh, well, I'll get it next time. So those are some of the kinds of things. are just people adapting to the new food package as well as the availability of the foods. And I think most of the conversation, Tamara, has been around uh, the 16-ounce loaf of bread, frankly, and its availability. It's a concern that we've heard expressed from the retail grocers nationally. Um, clearly, this is one of those changes that WIC is attempting to, and I'll, I'll, I'll use that loosely, uh, 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 transform the marketplace in healthy ways. And I think that there will be uh, an eventual change in the marketplace, but it's just going to take some period of time. I want to thank all of our panelists. Please join me in thanking them.